This past Wednesday afternoon, I spoke to a group of students who attend a Christian high school that is a sort of Protestant version of the Jewish day schools that many of our children attend. In between their semesters, they had enrolled in a week-long course exploring the broader context of their own Christian faith. They had never been to a synagogue. They had never spoken to a rabbi before. Their knowledge of Judaism was mostly gleaned from what they knew from the Bible. I love speaking to audiences like that. It's a creative challenge to summarize all of Judaism in 10 minutes to teenagers with little prior background. And as I've shared before, I find the questions that they ask to be absolutely unpredictable and absolutely fascinating. One student asked me if Jews ever had disagreements about matters of religious practice or ritual. And if we did, how have we resolved those disputes? So that gave me a chance to share with them that indeed, Jews don't always agree about matters of religious practice or ritual or matters of philosophy or worldview and that our sacred tradition is in large part a record of our disagreements and debates. And because we debate and analyze and try to prove the correctness of our position by using words and arguments and discourse, we have survived through the centuries of our exile with our portable homeland that is renewed each generation by our continued commitment to study Torah and argue about its meaning and implications and then live our lives according to our best understanding of what we are meant to do. Sometimes disputes are resolved, but never by compulsion or force, but only when one side of a debate convinces the Jewish people that its path is correct until a time arises when another option may become dominant. I left the students to notice some alarmed text messages from family. And only then did I see for the first time the images that had shocked and appalled men and women of goodwill across the country and across the world. There is a deliberate grandeur to Washington, D.C., no place more so than the Capitol building. That grandeur is meant to evoke a certain awe and reverence for the democratic process itself through which each one of us is represented. So many men and women whom I admire have worked and debated and legislated in the halls of Congress on behalf of human welfare and freedom. It was a profound sense of violation to see the Confederate battle flag, the banner of treason and hate being waved in the United States Capitol. It is a source of burning anger to know that the riot was inspired and encouraged by powerful politicians, including the president himself, who riled up an angry mob and then cowardly sent them on without him to spread havoc and violence. <clears throat> and it's frightening to be reminded of how our country sits at the very precipice of political violence that can threaten the safety of members of Congress acting on our behalf and can easily and quickly threaten our safety as well. Fear of anarchic violence and fear of the replacement of democratic deliberation by mob rule are rightfully contained by the fear and reverence for the authority that effective government can inspire. Rabbi Hanina, the Skan Kohen, the deputy to the high priest, said in Pirkei Avot, one should pray for the welfare of the government. She'il malei mora'a, were it not for the fear that the government instills, each individual would swallow up their neighbors alive. The government that Rabbi Chinina knew was Rome. And as the Skan Kohen, the perpetual deputy high priest, Rabbi Chinina was presumably passed over time and again for promotion that he deserved to become the high priest. Those of us learning Daf Yomi learned just a few weeks ago that Rabbi Chinina was the most qualified expert on the intricate laws of purity needed to be an excellent high priest. And he never entered the Holy of Holies on Yom Kippur. He never served in a position of full religious authority because a despotic foreign-imposed government did not want him in that role. Yet even that despotic foreign-imposed government was preferable to anarchy and the struggle of all against all. We have seen a small glimpse this week into what it looks like when there is no fear or reverence for governmental authority and when the orderly transition of power is replaced by a violent struggle of all against all to determine how power will be wielded by whom and for how long. But this fear or reverence for established authority is not the only fear I have been contemplating. Parashat Shemot opens with a description of the rapid decline in status of the Hebrews in Egypt. In just a few words, the Torah describes the descent from the generation of Yosef and his brothers who were honored in Egypt to slavery, oppression, and the murder of Hebrew babies. The first spark of redemption 
that halts and diverts this tragic story is the resistance of two midwives, Shifra and Pua, to Pharaoh's murderous plans. Shifra and Pua, the Torah tells us, feared God. And because they feared God, they were not afraid of Pharaoh, and they spared the Jewish boys. Between these two poles of reverence, reverence for government and reverence for God, is the entire framework for democratic self-government. Stable self-government in which the peaceful transfer of power is itself revered, even by those who are overlooked for leadership, like Rabbi Hanina, endures precisely because there is a way to perpetuate government from one leader to the next. And stable self-government requires citizens with moral backbone and moral clarity. Sometimes a midwife has to say no to a great king. Four years ago in Parshat Shemot, I spoke to you about the complicated relationship between religious Jews and democratic freedoms over the centuries. I shared that when Napoleon marched into Russia as a flawed standard bearer of liberty, equality, and brotherhood, he faced the spiritual opposition of the Balatanya, the first great Lubavitcher Rebbe, who argued that the cruelty and oppression of the Russian Tsar would bind the Jewish people to God and to the Torah, whereas the freedoms represented by Napoleon would alienate us from God and the Torah. Two centuries later, we know that the Balatanya might have been correct to reject Napoleon, but he was wrong about the political circumstances in which Judaism thrives. Democracy is good for Jews and good for Judaism because it requires the cultivation of character, and that is a project we should embrace and a business that we invented. Democracy is good for Jews and good for Judaism because resolving disputes and transferring power from one set of hands to another by deliberation and debate instead of violence is the most sustainable and reliable method humans have discovered to cultivate stability and continuity. The Roman Republic is one possible model for modern democratic self-government. Athenian democracy is another possible model for modern democratic self-government, but neither of those models lasted a very long time. But the culture of the Beit Midrash represents another ancient, enduring, and still vital model for democratic self-government. Our method for debating and deciding matters of the utmost importance, Devarim Ha'ondim Olam, without recourse to force or violence, but only through deliberation, debate, and discourse, has ensured our survival for thousands of years, a similar commitment has led to peace and freedom in the nations of the world that have adopted those methods for resolving their disputes. That has been this country's greatest strength, and with our renewed commitment to democracy, it can be so again. As the tide turns in favor of redemption in Parshat Shemot, the Torah presents one redemptive moment after another, each one necessary, but not sufficient to conclusively launch our freedom. Shifra and Pua had to resist Pharaoh's command to murder Hebrew babies. Moshe, leaving the palace to spend the day with his erstwhile Egyptian brothers, had to somehow understand that his true brothers were the Hebrew slaves he had been observing and express his solidarity with them and with us. But the final shift towards redemption occurs when the Hebrew slaves at long last, after generations of suffering and degradation, call out to God, and a long time after that, when the king of Egypt died, the Israelites were groaning under their bondage and cried out, and their cry for help from the bondage rose up to God. And Siv points out that this turning point in human history was sparked by our decision to gather and to pray. It does not say that we cried out to God while we were working, but rather that we cried out to God in a collective voice and in an organized way in response to our bondage. And this is my final request to you today. When frightening and tragic events occurred in recent years, I had the ability to find comfort in the community that we create when we gather for prayer here in our shul. I had faith that our prayers were heard, and I know but even when they would not be answered, at least I stood among good people who were sensitive to that which was wrong or tragic in the world, and that too was a source of strength. While we lack the capacity to gather in one place in prayer in large numbers, I ask you to connect your tefillot in the coming days to the fears and the hopes that we feel as Jews and that we feel as Americans, our neighbors and friends are falling victim to a deadly pandemic that is still increasing in scope. Yesterday saw the record number of COVID deaths so far. 
Our neighbors and friends are worried about their jobs and their ability to provide for their basic needs or those of their families. And our fellow citizens need some help in learning how to argue and debate without violence and without hatred. Shabbat Shalom.